Every person has a purpose and life continues to offer us opportunity after opportunity to further that purpose, to pursue that purpose. And many times people experience failure for no reason other than they refuse to embrace what God wants them to do. Today, we're looking again at the life of a man who was well acquainted with hardship and difficulty. He was well acquainted with what God could do, but also sometimes how it took God a little while to, to get, you know, get things in shape for him to be blessed. We're looking again today at the life of Joseph, and specifically today, we're looking at a life on purpose. We're going to find out and talk about just how intricately God is involved in our lives and just how he has a plan for our life and just how each one of us is designed to accomplish God's purpose. You see, life is but a journey. That's all it is. It's a journey, a marvelous adventure. But life is specifically designed. The journey that God has us on is specifically designed for each and every purpose excuse me, each and every person with you in mind. God has designed your life. He has incredibly made you. He has created you by design with purpose and he knows what he wants from you. He knows what he needs from you. You and I, each one of us, have been created by God's own hand. And as I said, God has a specific purpose in mind for each one of our lives. Every person created by God, has the potential to be great. Now, this is, you know, if you can believe something this morning, believe this. Believe that every person, you included, everyone has the potential, the God-given, designed, created by the hand of God, the god given design you are purposed by God to be great now let me share with you a definition of greatness because great in the eyes of man is not always great in the eyes of God okay you may not be designed by God to be what someone else imagines greatness is but you have the potential to be great Great in the eyes of God. You see, God counts us great when we reach the pinnacle of his will for our lives. Not our will for our lives. Not someone else's will for our lives. Not what the world imagines greatness is. But God counts us to be great whenever we reach the pinnacle of his will for our life. And do you know God has designed us for purpose? And he has a will for every one of us. Greatness, just like success, can only be measured by God. You know, the Bible asks us a question, you know, what would it profit a man? What would really be your gain if you did something and achieved something so that all the world thought you were wonderful and all the world thought you were great, but yet you missed the mark with God? Yet you missed getting to do what God created you to do, what God's purpose was for your life. Even if you accomplished something great and, and, and climbed high mountains or, or, you know, gained the whole world, but failed to achieve in God's eyes, what profit would that be? What would you give in exchange for accomplishing God's will, for pleasing God? Greatness, just like success, can only be measured by God. And greatness is solely dependent upon us reaching our God-given goals. God may not require from each and every one of you what he requires from, you know, from uh, the person sitting beside you. He may not require from you uh, that you do this or do that. He may from someone else. 
But what God has given you, God's goal for your life, accomplishing that, pursuing that, following that, is the only pathway to success, the only pathway to greatness. It's reported that Billy Graham, you know who Billy Graham is, you know, in times gone by in the 20th century, you know, Billy Graham was very often recognized in, in circles of high powers and, and governments would bring him. And he's such a tremendous evangelist, a man who impacted his generation, his world uh, and, 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 and the world for Jesus. Such a powerful man. He would hold crusades and whole stadiums would pour out of their seats coming to give their lives to Christ. So many famous men and women can trace their salvation back to his evangelistic anointing and call. What a man. It's reported that once he was asked if he would consider running and becoming the president of the United States, Billy Graham responded by saying, I have been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would not stoop, therefore, to be president of the United States. Now, Billy Graham had great respect for the office of the president, the person, the position. You know, he was not casting dispersions on those who were called or making light of the fact that, that you know, the, the president is a very honored position. Not at all. Billy was merely pointing out what he saw as so obvious and so many cannot see. Billy Graham's conviction was that any person... For any person to do anything other than what God had called them to do was a step down in life. Was beneath the call of God. Beneath the bar of God's acceptability. You see, what God has given each person to do is their highest calling. We should be satisfied with reaching our highest calling, what God has given each person to do, which may be different than what someone else is called to do, and it may be different than what someone else thinks you should do. And you might even find yourself chiding yourself for falling below the mark of some others that have, that have put a mark on a wall somewhere and said, this is success, and you may not have achieved that or reached that. You may have no desire to pursue that. God determines our calling. Life should be a script that only God can write. A journey whose God can only be found in the Holy Spirit. As the Lord continues to keep directing us toward our purpose and toward our greatest calling and toward the things that he wants for us to do and things he wants us to accomplish with or without respect to what someone else might be called to do. You see, only God can choose a destiny and only God can measure success. You know, the prophet Jeremiah was told in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, God said, you know, Jeremiah, before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, before you were created in the belly, I knew you. And I had already consecrated you, sanctified you, separated you, set you apart. I had already designed you with purpose. You are a very specific individual. And before you were ever formed in your mother's belly, I had decided that your greatest day would be achieved and accomplished as a prophet to the nations. It was God's design. Just like every person is designed by God for a purpose. And life continues to offer each one of us, each one of you. Life continues to offer you opportunities to further that purpose. God continues to offer opportunities. It does not mean that each person takes advantage of the opportunities God gives them because certainly some people are called to do things that they really don't want to do. We see it over and over throughout the Bible that God often asks people to do something and they had really rather not do it. Do you remember the story of Ananias when, when Saul of Tarsus 
Tarsus was headed to Damascus and, and he got close to Damascus. He saw a great light and, and he had an encounter with Jesus. He was blinded and went into Damascus. He sat in a room, a dark room, blinded for three days before anyone came to see him. Why? Because that's how long it took God to convince Ananias over and over again. He was saying to Ananias, go to Saul of Tarsus. Go, I have something to tell him. And Ananias was saying, nope, don't want to. You don't understand. I'm afraid. I'm, not, I, 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 I'm scared that he's going to put me in jail. Don't think so. Not going to do it. It was three days before God was able to convince Ananias to go and lay hands on Saul of Tarsus. He received his side and a great calling of the Lord as a result. But many times people are asked to do something that they may not see themselves able to do, capable to do, even want to do. They may think it's too much for them or they may think it's too far below them. I'm reminded of, a, reminded of another man in the book of Acts. His name was Philip. Philip went down to Samaria. He was a deacon in the church in Jerusalem. And, and God encouraged him to go about 45 miles north to Samaria. And when he got to Samaria, the, the, the capital city there, as we best understand, a place where now sets the city of Nablus. And, and there he preached Christ unto them. And everyone gave heed to the words he spoke. And they all got born again. He was so excited. It was such a revival. The biggest revival the world had ever seen. He was such a big man and then God spoke to him and said, I want you to go out into the desert because there's one man I want you to witness to. Do you know Philip could have said, hold on a second. I'm the biggest thing that's ever hit the world. Wait, I only hold big crusades. I only do, you know, thousands of people. I mean, come on, Lord, I don't want it to time it. You know, I'm in mass evangelism. He could have had, you know, I'm, I'm incorporating. I will as soon as I get incorporated. Uh, Philip Evangelistic Association, just hold on, Lord. You know, uh, do you know who I think I am? I am, but he didn't. He obeyed the call of the Lord and he went out into the desert and joined himself to a chariot with one man and their witness to that one man. I'm reminded of a man called Jonah who knew the call of God on his life, knew the purpose that God intended for him. It was clear to him that God wanted him to go to Nineveh, but yet he got up and went in the opposite direction. Ended up getting on a ship in Joppa and sailed out into the Mediterranean and there a great storm came and he ended up being cast overboard and ended up in the belly of a great fish and God still dealing with this man who in reality did not want to go. And finally when he went to Nineveh and had a tremendous outpouring of the mercy and the forgiveness of God, a great move of God, yet he went up on a hill and sat down sad and depressed. It was not that he, that, that, that he had not done the will of God, it's just that he wasn't happy with what God wanted him to do. Let me be, you know, honest with you and be a good pastor and let you know God may not always tell you to do something you want to do. But pleasing God is our only pathway to greatness. Pleasing God is our only measure of success. And God stands ready to fulfill the hope of our calling within us. Every person has a purpose and life continues to offer us opportunity after opportunity to further that purpose, to pursue that purpose. And many times people experience failure for no reason other than they refuse to embrace what God wants them to do or to do it God's way. You know, we cannot refuse to do God's will or refuse to do it God's way and still expect the blessings of God on our adventures. This does not mean that people are not successful in and of themselves in the world's eyes. It is possible to achieve a measure of success in the eyes of men without God's blessing, without God's help, and without God's approval. We know that. If that were not so, then the pornography industry would not even exist. If that were not so, so many other industries would not even exist. But many industries do and many people are very successful in the eyes of man without God's approval, without God's help. But let me tell you, man's measure of success will certainly last no longer than their last breath on planet earth. And life is short. How sad it would be to enter into eternity 
not pleasing God. How sad it would be to realize that eternity is too long to be lived as a failure in the eyes of God. One of the enduring qualities that Joseph's life teaches us is that Joseph recognized the fact that life is often an unpredictable journey. You know, we can't always know what's around the next curve or over the next hill. We can't always know what it is we're facing, you know, tomorrow, the next day. Life is unpredictable. We are on a journey. It's an adventure, and yet we cannot always know what is ahead in life. And Joseph's life teaches us this. <clears throat> Joseph, however, remained in God's favor, in God's will, whatever happened, because he continued to just want to please God. You know, there's something wonderful about just backing up and saying, Lord, whatever you want. I know what I want. I know what I think I need. But Lord, whatever you want. Joseph was on a journey, not just any journey, but Joseph was on a God-ordained journey, a God-protected journey, a God-predicted journey, a God-blessed journey. He was on a journey for God. And as long as Joseph kept trusting and pleasing God, that made God responsible for the outcome. Isn't that great? Wow. Well, you know, we've been studying the life of Joseph. Allow me, if you would, to catch us up because we're going to jump to Genesis chapter 45. This past Wednesday night, we were in chapter 41. So let me tell you quickly about chapter 42, 43, and 44, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. This is going to be a brief synopsis of those three chapters. Please go back and read them. But many of you are already familiar with the life of Joseph. You've been reading it. We've been studying it, many of us together. But uh, go back and refresh yourself if you need to, all right? When we last left Joseph on Wednesday evening, we left him standing in a favored place. He had been accepted in the courts of Pharaoh as a very wise man. And he was ruler of everything under Pharaoh's hand. Seven years of bountiful harvest had been in the land of Egypt. And Joseph had been getting in store. He had been saving a fifth part of everything that had been harvested. Because he knew that seven years of famine was about to hit the land. And certainly it did. It came just as fast. And the famine was so bad that, that, that immediately people began to feel the results of it. And people began to come to Joseph and needing to buy grain and needing to have something so that they could eat. And them and their animals, their families. And so as this was happening, it was realized that the famine was not only in the land of Egypt, but it also stretched outside the land of Egypt, even into the land of Canaan, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had lived. At that time, Jacob and 11 of his sons, he had 12 sons, Joseph was one, he was sold into Egypt. The other 11 sons lived with their father. Benjamin, perhaps the youngest, was maybe, a, you know, 30-something years old. His other brothers were in their 40s and 50s or so. Maybe even one of them near 60. They had sons of their own. By this time, Benjamin already had 10 sons. He wasn't the little boy you might imagine. He'd already had 10 sons, okay? So they were living with their father, and they were living only about 45 to 50 miles north of the border of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? They weren't that far away. Living there near Beersheba, which is just at the northern end of the Negev Desert, uh, what was also called the land of Edom. But at any rate, they were experiencing famine. 
And one day, Jacob, the patriarch, said to his 11 sons, he said, listen, you know, we have no food here, but I hear there's food in Egypt. I want to send 10 of you down to Egypt. Benjamin, I'm not sending you, not sending my youngest, because his youngest son was a son from his most favored wife, and he did not want to lose that son. I'm sending the rest of you down to Egypt. I want you to buy grain there and bring it back so that we don't starve this year. There's nothing, there's no harvest for this year. So the 10 sons got together. They went down into Egypt. And when they got there, they had to follow the same suit that every other foreigner did. They had to appear before Joseph. Now, Joseph was their brother, but they did not recognize him. He was dressed like an Egyptian, you know. He was a ruler, you know, and he had learned to speak the Egyptian language, and and, uh, they were still speaking Hebrew. He understood them, but they did not understand him. And so he kept his his, uh, uh, identity a secret. While they came before him, the Bible says Joseph remembered the dream that he had had at 17. He's now 39 years old. He remembered this dream and his brothers having sold him and all that it cost. And so he said to them, uh, uh, tell me about you. Who are you? They said, well, we are the sons of a man named Jacob who lives in the land of Canaan and we're coming for food. He says, tell me, is your father alive? They said, yes, he is well. Well, do you have any other brothers? Well, yes, we have another brother, a younger brother named Benjamin. And he questioned them a lot. And then he told them, I don't believe you. I believe you're spies. You've come down here just to, just to check us out. And you're going, going back and, you know, you're going to bring an army. And you're going to, you know, take our grain and take our food. I believe you're spies. They said, we're not spies. We promise you. He says, no. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. In order for you to prove you're not spies, I'm going to test you. I'm going to keep one of you. I'll keep him, Simeon. And I'm going to send the rest of you back. You go back and you get your other brother. If you're really not lying to me and you really have another brother, you go get him and you bring him and you show him to me and then I'll believe you. They didn't know what to do and so what could they do? He kept Simeon in in, in, in incarcerated and he sent them back with provision you can read the story there's more details about it you know he sent their money back with him and everything it really made them afraid but they got back home and told their dad they said father he told us that that if we don't bring Benjamin back we can't come back he he'll believe we're spies and and Jacob said nope no way in the world am I sending Benjamin back I've already lost one son of my favored wife. I'll not lose the other. I would go down to my grave with heartache. And so as the time passed on, perhaps more than a year, they ran out of provision. There was little that could be done. Jacob went back to his 10 sons and said, go and get more. Nine of them now. Go and get more grain in Egypt. They said, oh, we're not going. We were told that if we went back down there, we would be counted as spies and we would be perhaps put to death. We're not going unless we can take Benjamin. He said, no, you're not taking Benjamin. He said, they, he said well, the man told us we had to bring our brother. And, and Jacob said, well, why in the world did you even tell him you had a brother? You know, that's our logic, isn't it? They said... Well, Dad, he asked us a lot of questions. I mean, he really grilled us. He asked about you, and he asked specifically if we had a brother. He was very detailed in his questions. He knows a lot. We gave him information. And unless we bring Benjamin back, we get no more food. And they promised to take care of Benjamin and bring him back. So Dad said, okay, regrettably, I'll do this. But bring him back. They went off. When they arrived in Egypt... Joseph saw them and he knew his brother Benjamin was with them, his full-blooded brother. His heart was tender. He had them taken to his house. When they were taken to his house, they were rejoined with Simeon. And, and it's so uh, 
made them afraid. They said, oh no, we've been brought here to the house because he wants to capture us and hurt us. And Oh no. And, but when he arrived, when Joseph arrived at his house, he had them set down to eat. He provided a great banquet. In fact, for Benjamin, he gave Benjamin five times as much food as he did anybody else. At one point, Joseph's heart broke so much that he had to go into a back room and weep because he didn't want them to see him weeping. And he came back out and he was still, you know, not letting them know his identity. But looking at his brother and realizing what was they were going through and, you know, he, he concocted another plan. He thought, I'll send them home. But I'll have my cup placed in Benjamin's sack. So he did. On their way home, Joseph sent an army. They found the cup in Benjamin's sack. They brought them back to Joseph. And, you know, it looked like Joseph's intent was to make them all slaves. But he just said, no, I'm just going to keep Benjamin. The rest of you go home. They said, we can't. And with that, they opened up their heart. They broke. And they began to pour out their testimony. And Judah even offered to take his place. Joseph was so moved that he said to everyone, everyone get out of my presence except these men. And when all the Egyptians were gone, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. He cried so loud that everyone in the house heard him. Let's pick up this account in Genesis chapter 45 now. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that Joseph could no longer restrain himself and he began to weep, made everybody leave. And verse 3 says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? You can imagine his brothers, but his, his brothers couldn't answer him. They, they had a lump in their throat. They were shocked. They were, you know, they might have thought he was a lunatic. You know, who knows? You know? For they were dismayed, they were confused, they were perplexed, they were shocked in his presence. Verse 4, and Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they, you know, no doubt cautiously got closer and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. The one you sold into Egypt. Oh my goodness, don't you know by now he knows this. This got to be him. Oh, we're afraid. They'd already been arguing with one another, Simeon, you know, and Reuben. And, you know, Reuben had already said, I told you we shouldn't do this. I mean, they went back and forth, you know. They're thinking, you know, that, that this, you know, God is, is punishing us. God was just waiting on a time to get us for what we did. Listen, God is not in the I'm going to get you business, Okay. God is in the, I'm going to bless your business. God is not waiting for a moment to look back and see what you did and find a chance to trip you up and beat you up. He's not in the, I'm going to get your business. God's in the, I'm going to set you up to succeed business. Okay? God was not punishing them for what they did. He was preserving them because he loved them. He wasn't punishing he was protecting but they couldn't see it they were afraid verse 5 Joseph tells them but now do not be grieved you know do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves you know I'm I'm not angry with you I'm not upset with you don't be upset with yourselves sure you sold me here but it was really God who sent me before you to preserve life. Don't be mad at yourself. This is a God thing. Verse 6. For these two years the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be no uh, you know, plowing. Uh, uh, no harvesting. Verse 7. A second time he says this. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. He's trying to convince them. Don't you know they're shocked? Imagine, just imagine what they're thinking and how they're looking at him. 
you know? I mean, they're shocked. This has been, you know, uh, perhaps 20 to 23 years since they've seen him. They've been carrying the burden of their sin, the weight of their transgression, the secrets of their heart. They've been tortured and tormented. God hadn't been doing it. They've been doing it to themselves. And now they're afraid that God's going to get them. Now, God's not in the I'm going to get you one day business. Okay. Verse 8. A third time, Joseph says, so now, so now, listen to me now. Hello, look at me, look at me, look at me now. Guys, you know, brothers, yeah, look at me. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord over all of his house and ruled throughout all the land of Egypt. Wow. What is Joseph describing to them? He's describing that life is a journey. Most often an unpredictable journey, but a journey on purpose. God had purpose for the journey of my life. Joseph was not afraid of where his journey might lead him. Joseph was not angry over how his journey had ill affected him or perhaps his plans for his life. Joseph was not, you know, continually complaining about the hardships of his journey. He was not fixated on all those difficulties. Joseph was not bitter about the personal cost of his journey. Joseph realized that he was not defined by the limitations of his journey. In the end, Joseph realized something that we have been repeating around here for years. <laughs> Joseph realized that the journey is your friend. It might be hard to see in prison. It might be hard to embrace in the pit. It might be difficult in moments to realize, but the truth prevails. The journey is your friend. It is the journey that prepares us to operate at destiny's capacity. To struggle against the journey or to sit down in the corner and say, I'm not going to participate. I don't like where I am. I don't like what I'm going through. I, you know, this is too far beneath me. I'm just, I'm not going to participate. I'm going to sit down and I'm just, you know, uh, you know not going to play the game. That, to struggle against the journey or to not participate would be to believe that God cannot rescue you from your troubled places. God does not cause our troubles. But God gets in every trouble we have with both feet and does his best to guide us out so that he might take us to our greatest day and so that he might work in us and on us before he works for us and through us. Regardless of where we are in life presently, God has our purpose in mind. God will not forget your purpose, that to which he has designed you, called you, prepared you, and has worked over and over to position you, giving opportunities to guide you back to and into, whether, it's, whether your name is Jonah or whether your name is Philip. You know, whether you're someone who takes every step with God, regardless of what it costs, or someone who believes your personal opinion should prevail. You know, our comfort may not be the biggest thing that God was thinking about whenever he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Ooh, that's a good word. Come on now, we're going somewhere with this. I got just a few minutes here, but we're going to get there, okay? Every day, even today, you are here on purpose. God does not cause our hardships, but given the chance, he will work through them and with them and continue to guide us toward his perfect will for our life. Okay? And even though the devil may determine to harm us, God will help us overcome. Okay? I don't know how fast you can write, but, but I'm going to give you four things rather quick. Four more lessons from the life of Joseph that teaches us how to successfully live a purpose-filled life. Number one, if God is not concerned about it, we don't need to be either. Okay? That's the truth. If you're facing something, going through something, some difficulty, some struggle, some, 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 some predicament of life, listen, if God is not 
worried about it. If God is not concerned about it, we don't need to be either. You see, not everything that bothers us bothers God. Not everything that, that, that happens in our life is meant to move us, okay? God may have a plan that's so far beyond anything we know at the moment. If God is not concerned about it, we don't need to be. Number two, if God is concerned about it, we really don't need to be. <laughs> Hello? If God is concerned about it, we really don't need to be. God's big enough to take care of the things that God should take care of. He's that big, you know. I mean, realistically, he might not need our help. And certainly, he tells us in Romans the 12th chapter, verse 19, that vengeance belongs to him. He's the one that'll take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. So, number one, if God is not concerned about it, we don't need to be. Number two, if he is concerned about it, we really don't need to be. He can take care of it. Isn't that great? Amen. Number three. If God tells us to do something, do it. If God tells you to do something, do it. But if he does not, just keep quiet and let him handle it. God never told Joseph to make a prison break. It's only 50 miles home, son. He had the keys to the jail. If God tells us to do something, do it. But God is never going to tell you to sit around, get depressed, get angry, start fussing at somebody or something, start wishing that they would fail so you could succeed, start, you know, you know God's never going to tell you to do that. Don't do that. If, he, if he's not worried about it, you shouldn't be. And if he is concerned about it, you really shouldn't be. But if he tells you to do something, do it, okay? But we can't go around trying to do what only God can do. There's no one else but Jesus can be your savior. No one else but Jesus. Okay? There is a difference. As I told the first service this morning, there is a difference between manipulation and manifestation. Manipulation means this is what I can do about it. Manifestation is God shows up and fixes it. We all need to wait on the man from the station. <laughs> That's an old joke. Little boy had a headache. He went in to his mama, who was a praying woman, and said, Mama, got a headache. She prayed for him. He went back outside to play. He came back in, you know, a little while later and said, Mama, I still got a headache. She said, Well, son, we prayed. We're just waiting on the manifestation. You know, and about two hours later, she saw him sitting out on the curb in front of the house with his hands in his head in his hands. And, and she went out there and said, What are you doing? He said, I still got a headache. I'm waiting on that man from the station. <laughs> <laughs> waiting on that man from the station. Listen, we all deserve a manifestation, not a manipulation. There's a difference between begging and blessing. Begging is what we can do. Blessing is what God can do. Begging often will create manipulation and will fix a problem that God wanted to fix permanently. And it's only fixed temporarily because we didn't get the blessing and the manifestation of God. We got a result of the begging and the manipulation of what we can do to fix a problem. But believe me, not only... Is no one else our savior, but we cannot save anybody else either. We should never allow ourselves to be manipulated. If God tells us to do something, do it. If God doesn't tell us to do it, don't. We need to know the difference because God measures success. And it would be terrible to go to heaven and face God realizing that you could have been successful. You could have been great. God just didn't, he didn't want that from you. He wanted something else. That's a reality. We're supposed to run our race, finish our course, and keep our faith. And not be drawn off the path of our life and begin a journey that does not belong to us. It's very important. All right, I got to give you number four really quick, okay? Number one, if God is concerned about it, we don't need to be. Number two, if God is not concerned about it, we really don't need to be. Number three, if God tells you to do something, do it. Just make sure it's God. Number four is, comes from a verse in chapter 45 which is the last thing that Joseph said to his brothers before they left. He loaded them up with good stuff, said, go get daddy. Chapter 45, verse 24 says this. It says, then he sent his brothers. Joseph sent his brothers away. And as they departed, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. <laughs> what a good scripture. Oh, what a good passage. Oh, man, come on now. That, that, that's worth a little light bulb going off in your head. Okay? What did he say to him? 
Number four, don't quarrel along the way. He knows, Joseph knows, he's been through this long journey of purpose. He's been through this long journey and he knows, but he also knows his brothers. He knows when they leave there, they're apt to start bickering with one another and blaming whose fault, vindicating me and blaming you. And this, you, if you hadn't have done this and if they hadn't have done this and well, this one, you know, all that stuff that causes arguments. Here's what Joseph knew. Joseph knew that their best days were just ahead. Man, we're about to have the family. We're about to have a party. We're about to fix everything that's been wrong for decades. We're about to get everything right. Don't mess it up with fussing. (laughs) Come on now. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Don't quarrel on the way. You're on your way. God has a purpose for your life. He's guiding you to greatness. He really is. But greatness may not be what you have always imagined it to be. It is simply fulfilling your purpose. Reaching the pinnacle of your calling. God's will is our highest calling. God knows that he's drawing you along. And you're going to a better place. My wife and I, the first five years of our marriage was horrible. You've heard it. I quit smoking because the ashtrays are heavy and she liked to throw things. <laughs> One day she picked up a bottle and threw it, hit me in the head and knocked me out. One day I slapped her into the next room. She hit the rocking chair. The rocking chair went over and she rolled all the way in the living room. Now don't do this, by the way, Okay. I'm talking to the women. <laughs> yeah, we fought. Yeah, it was hard. It was tough. But one of the things that we have learned in life is to stop quarreling along the way. Yeah, we'll have different opinions. Yes, we'll have, you know, even want different things. Yes, but, we, but arguing is not going to get us there. Fussing and fighting. You know, preserve the unity. Keep the peace. You know, just be kind. Sometimes it means I don't get my way. Sometimes it means she doesn't get her way. You know, that's, that's life. But playing a blame game, playing a fault game. Listen, guys, don't you hit your wife now, okay? That's wrong, okay? I was very wrong. It's a wonder her brothers didn't kill me, Okay? Brenda wanted me to make sure I ran that disclaimer, okay? Don't quarrel along the way. If God is concerned about it, you don't need to be. If he's not concerned about it, you really don't need to be. If he tells you to do something, do it. Just don't be manipulated. Wait for the manifestation. You know, don't go begging. Wait for the blessing. And don't quarrel while you're on this journey. We're going somewhere better. Okay. Me and Brenda, one day we're going to heaven. Probably not on our 40th, but I'll take you there one day, sweetheart. You'll know when. When I scream, our greatest day is yet ahead. <laughs> uh, I love you guys. Thank you for enduring a few minutes past lunch. I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not traditional, but the word of God will go with you. Decide today you're in stone to stop quarreling along the way. That means one of you might have to learn how to process life a little different. Or both of you. Submit it to God. It doesn't matter whose fault yesterday was. God's all about our tomorrows. That's what Joseph was trying to get his brothers to understand. It's not about what you did. It's about what God wants to do. Okay? All right. Won't you stand? Oh, the Lord is good. Father, 
We're so grateful to be in your plan, Lord. There's purpose for every life. My life, Lord, every life. Lord, you still have purpose. God, in my greatest day will only be recognized when I achieve what you want me to do. Regardless of what other people think is successful, Lord, God, help each one of us, Father, to embrace our calling, Lord, and just rise up, Lord, to be the best us, Lord, that we can be. Lord, it might require a lot of time from some. It may require little time from others, Lord. Perhaps, Lord God, uh, our highest calling, Lord, is to be a good uh, husband or wife, mom, dad, a, a community worker, a kind neighbor, Lord. Maybe that's the greatest you require of us, Lord. And God, there's nothing, Lord, that we should feel bad about when we're achieving, Lord, what you have purpose for us to do. Perhaps, Lord, there is some uh, a journey or adventure, Lord, even at great personal cost that you wish to draw us to. God, speak to us, Lord. Let us know it's you, sir, so that we can, Father, make sure we're walking your path of purpose for our life. God, take care of the things, Lord, that only you can take care of. Lord, uh, in, involve us, Lord, when you want to. And Lord, uh, uh, God, help us to in, embrace involvement in any way you wish. But help us, Father. Lord, each one of us, Father, we just lay down our right to fuss and fight. We just lay down our right to be angry, Lord, to be contentious. Lord, we just lay down our right to always be right. Lord, we lay down our right to never be at fault. Lord, we lay it down, Lord. We never had it in the first place. Lord, help us to have a soft heart, a gentle voice. Lord, and preserve unity. In Jesus' name.